So it's Rabbi Mordechai here. It's um, an amazing day. Um, it's Rosh Kodesh. You know, it's it's the, it's the beginning of, of a new cycle. It's the beginning of a new process. And, you know, now is the time, you know, everyone, you know, everyone who's religious is, you know, pretty much excited. You know, they're, they're saying additional to Philod. You know, some people are, you know, having special meals. You know, it's it's a big deal. But the question is, why is it a big deal? Like, okay, it's a new month, it's a new beginning of a new month, it's a new cycle, it's a new beginning. Okay, I hear, I hear, but like, what's, what's, what's going on? What should we be thinking about when we hear the concept of Rosh Kodesh, right? When we hear about this idea of like a, a new moon or a new cycle. So one idea is to think about is like, why did Hashem, why did Hashem, you know, why did he have to create the, the, the stars and the, the moons and the planets and the earth? Like, why, why do you have to do that? Like, what, I mean, we needed, we needed lights in the sky. Okay, maybe he could have did it in another way. Why do you have to, what's this concept about these pronounced entities, you know? And, you know, the Midrash, you know, it says some interesting thing. And everything with the Midrash, we, we, when we learn the Midrash, we, we, the Midrashim, we, we want to be able to, read what's being said and being re and, 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 and read it in conjunction with the Pasukim inside of the Chumash, right? And we want to see both of these ideas and we want to see whether they're similar and whether they're dissimilar and be able to draw meaning from those, those, those parables, how they interact with each other, right? We just not, we're not just reading it in like a, like a history book or a set of commentaries. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a study of reason. Right and, and 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 rational deduction and and being able to to understand the the inferences that our sages were trying to say because there's so much inside the midrashim there's there's kabbalistic texts there's 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 things that are, are I mean Rashi pulls so much from you know the midrashim you know and, but when you go into the midrashim and the depth of the midrashim you can see like maybe Rashi was bringing it for this particular point like you know it, it's it's a big science but the point is just saying the midrashim talks about this experience of, you know, Hashem creating all of these planets in, 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 in this, this universe and these stars and this whole dynamic. And, you know, it explains it in different parables, but there was one story I really, I really enjoyed, you know, and there was a story about a king who was like, you know, he was known for being like the most like amazing, you know, brilliant, genius, you know, could figure out anything, knew everything, all the languages, could answer any questions. He was wealthy beyond the man, you know, he was that person. And, and so people would literally travel around the world to come and see him, right? People would come, whatever. And it got to a point that he, so many people would come to see him that he wouldn't even have time to deal with, like, you know, maybe even like 5% of the people that would come. So what he did was that he built this whole humongous uh, uh, um, 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 kind of like entryway to like his like kingdom. And this entryway was like three dimensional. It had different designs. It was utilizing the sun rays to create different moods and different feelings. It was like, it was like, it was like Battlestar Galactia. And this was a long time ago. And this, and he was like, literally, it was almost like you could like see space. Like he had a portal, you know what I mean? Like he just would create this whole amazing thing. And the reason why he made it, he said, he declared, he says, if anyone can, can, can make anything like this, they could say they're at my level, right? Because he couldn't meet everyone himself. So he couldn't display his brilliance, or everyone couldn't connect to him, right? And so he created something elaborate. And not only that, he created a teaching method that he trained specific children inside of the kingdom. And he had those children that he trained, he had them go out and, 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 and answer questions and, 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 and to give insight to, to, to different things. So, he, he created a physical structure and then he actually created these people that went out and with his teaching and learning method 
and went out and, 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 and fixed problems like in the world. And that was his way of showing us. And he said, whoever could create something like this, come in, come, come. you can say you're as great as me. And so the sages use this parable, you know, with a little bit of my like spice added to it, you know, but the, the sages, you know, um, bring this parable to, to express why God created the universe and why he created all these stars and why he created all these planets and why he created all these heavens and why the dimensions and all this. So we could be at all that something so great exists. You know, something that we couldn't even fathom. We could never create a star, at least at this point in history, right? We couldn't even fathom the idea of creating a planet or even a rock, you know? But the point is just saying that that, that we, we get that from the beginning of, of, of creation. We get this idea. And then also you have to look at it. So we're, we're getting, we're, we're building, we're, we're, build, we're building, you know, Hashkafa around the moon, the new moon, right? We want to see this galaxy. We want to see everything interconnected. So we're starting off with this idea of God displaying an aspect of his humility by, by creating the universe, right? By creating the universe, right? He, he does it. And obviously we have the famous story with the, with the, 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 the moon, you know, coming to, you know, the, the, you know, the planet, you know, competing with each other, you know, having all being the same size. And so Shem decided to shrink what we know that as the moon and, 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 and uh, that, that shrinkage allowed it to become like a, a vessel, you know, like a receiver of the sun's rays. But, but Hashem also gave the moon this, this koach and this connection to all the stars in the galaxy, right? So there's something very powerful through the stars, but the, the sages use that to explain this idea of humility. Right, so we can look at it and say, "Oh, we can look at it and say, oh, well, Dafka, we're talking about this whole experience with the moon and the sun, and who's bigger and compete, or is that a marshal to understand how the world was created? That was the humility that is shown, that is shown, like in the aspect, like removed and like bittled an aspect of itself to give existence to this reality." And in, in this aspect of us being able to recognize Hashem is only through Hashem's humility. Like, I mean, that aspect that we understand on our level is humility. That aspect of, 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 of making yourself, you know, accessible and connection. You know, I, I, I use that analogy once. It's like, you know, when you think about the humility of Hashem, right? I mean, it's like, we can't even imagine what it is. I mean, it's like, it's so far. It's so far and so high. Because we don't even understand Hashem. We just understand his attributes. So to understand Hashem's humility means that we would have to understand Hashem. And if we don't even understand Hashem, but we're still learning out through the attributes, his humility, this is showing something completely great. So I always use this analogy. Like, so imagine if you had like, like a four-year-old kid, right? And this four-year-old kid went on a basketball court and he played one-on-one -on -one against LeBron James, right? LeBron James is considered the one of the greatest NBA players of all time. I think they said in February, you know, he should be surpassing, you know, um, you know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the, the most points scored ever in the NBA. You know, he's a true success story, you know? And, um, but the point is he's this massive person, like physically, he's like, 6'10", 6, 6'11", 6, I don't even know, like he's so big and he's like so lean and like he just, he's a phenomenal physical specimen, like he's a humongous athlete, right? And you know what, hey, you got to bring a little gosh into this. We were all the way up in the stars, you got to bring it all the way down too, right? Even that's the point. But the point is just saying that, or the idea is, is that Le imagine LeBron James playing against this four-year-old, right? And this four-year-old believes that if he wins this game, He's going to get all the toys in the world, all the toys in the world. If he, if he, if he, if he could beat LeBron James, right? So LeBron James plays against this kid, but LeBron James humbles himself and lowers himself to such a level that that kid not only feels he's playing against LeBron James, 
Like when I say like a LeBron, I'm saying LeBron James is making this kid feel that they're actually having a competitive game. He's he's his goal is to make this kid something. This kid is the four year old. This is the greatest competing against the greatest athlete. But LeBron James is, is humbling himself to such a level where he is he's convinced this kid that they're actually playing together. And not only did he convince the kid that they're playing on the same level, right? That the kid perceives that he can win. This, this, this is the level of, in a way to kind of understand Hashem, allowing us to understand that he exists. The fact that Hashem has allowed us to understand that he did exist, this idea is, is, is humongous. Humongous. When we're talking about in Parcha Vayera, that Hashem is communicating Moshe, punny to punny. That, that idea, like we can't, we're, we're talking about the stars, but over here, we're saying even the Hashem even goes further. He goes face to face with man. Right? So that, that's, that's, that's a way to understand the universe. Right, that we see outside around us, that is an expression of Hashem bringing Himself to a level that we can even comprehend. That, okay, that that's that that there's something so uh, uh, luminous and detached and big that we could sit there and say, "Hey, you know what? Wow, God exists right here. This is crazy. This is like too big. This is too crazy. God, he, a person never heard of the Torah. God forbid, never heard Bereshit Bar Elohim. Right, never heard that." But when he looks up at those stars, he knows something's greater than him, functioning what's going on around him. Right? This is this is this is Hisham's humility. In terms of how we understand the expression of us being able to understand something so great and beyond us. So this is this is this is should be the thought on Rosh Kodesh. Right? How did this whole thing come together? This moon, this whole thing. What, what's going on? How do we get here? This, this is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. So now we, now that we've accepted that this galaxy that's around us, we're going to move to part two. Part two is understanding that this whole galaxy that we have above us is an intermediary to a reality beyond our, 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 our human brain and intellect. Okay, wait, let me say that. It's not beyond because we have stages and we have writings and teachings that people who experience and receive revelation about these levels. Let's put this in perspective. What we're saying is, is that when we think about space and the galaxy, we, we look at it and we're like, wow, this is so far, this is so far beyond earth. This is a whole nother, set of situations, there's a whole set of experiences happening on Pluto and Neptune right now that I know nothing about, that are functioning, things are functioning. I'm not saying there's aliens and all this other like kind of like type stuff. I'm just saying there's functioning, you know, they, they have atmosphere, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's things going on, there's sounds, there's all types of things going on on these different planets. And it's happening right now, right? So what I'm saying is I can't really I can't really comprehend that right now. And what I'm saying is, is that this whole universe that we're seeing, this galaxy, the stars, the planets, that's only an intermediary between a reality even higher than that, beyond, beyond, beyond this type of physicality. Like what we're dealing with right now is the lowest levels of the physical reality. What exists above that, it keeps going. It keeps going and going and going and going in levels and levels and levels. We're at the lowest level of God's revealment. So the space, the universe, the galaxy is, is in essence an intermediary. It's, it's the baloney and the sandwich, right? You have the bottom piece of bread, which is, which is earth. This is our existence. And then you have the you, you have the the, the 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 bologna, the meat, the kosher meat, and you have that. That's the galaxy. That's the universe. That's the planets. And then there's something even above that. 
that other piece of bread that expresses the, even the higher worlds even beyond that. This is Rosh Kodesh. This is what's going on. This is the this is the alignment in the mechanism that's happening when God says that there is a new system of light that's going to be revealed. Right? There's going to be a new system of light that's going to be revealed. And that new system of light is marked by this concept of counting of the new moon. And you got to realize it had to be a participatory process, right? The Torah says like in the beginning of creation, everything was in a potential state. And to Adam, Rishon, the first man was created. Then, then everything, everything blossomed, the, 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 everything starts functioning, everything comes alive. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like when you, it's like when you're in high school and you're the cool kid, when you go to the, when, when, when you come to the party, that's when the party really starts. Right? Like when you walk in that room, everybody's there, everyone's hanging out, and you just come in, it's like, boom, now the party started. So, like, when Adam came into reality, the party started for creation. Everything blossomed, everything grew. So, the process of man counting the moon is, is the dynamic of, of that light coming into this world. It, it has to be revealed through man's acknowledgement. Yes, it's in a potential state. Yes, it's it cycles. All these things exist. But that light and the impact on creation does not happen until man counts that moon. And that was the beginning of a new reality. It was a new reality. It was a new reality because you read the system, the system, and it brings me to the third point, the system itself of the of the of the of the um, of the moon, knowing what that system of the moon is, now puts all the other dominoes into effect. Now, because of this new moon, I know when Yom Tov Yomar, now I know when the Shefa of the 15th of Nisan comes down. That powerful light, that powerful light, that, that transition, that transition, you know that 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 happened on the that 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 light of transition that comes down on the fifteenth of Nisan. That light now I have access to it because now I can count it because I know the system of the moons, and I can count the moon cycles and I can know when that light of 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 Matan Torah comes into the world. I know when that light of 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 the judgment of man happens, right? I know the harvesting seasons. I know that the, my whole spiritual experience is connected to agriculture, was connected to the constellations, which is an influence by an upper light that's coming down from the upper world into this world. I'm, 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 I'm aware of this. So it's not just counting a moon. You know, like, okay, counting new moon, wow, yeah, new, wow, yeah, it's a new moon cycle. It's like a new thing, you know, it's like a Jewish thing. We count the moon. No, this is... This is the system of how the universe is functioning and what light is coming into this world and what we should be aware of. And we can use our conscious mind to know exactly what light is coming into this world and we can connect our consciousness to that light and we can receive it. And we can rise above the negative influences that also exist inside of every month. There's negative and positive influences. But we have the ability to rise above. We are above the mazal of whatever the month is. How do we rise above that mazal? By understanding what that mazal is and utilizing the tools to elevate our consciousness directly to the creator. But we have to have the, the coordinates. You know, We have to be able to travel with the coordinates. So yeah, so that, that's where we're at. So that's a general idea. We didn't even talk about the month itself. We haven't got there because without understanding the, 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 the veracity and the vastness and the humongousness that we at our level have the coordinates to understand a new moon cycle. And that new moon cycle allows us to understand when the life force of God and what quality is trickling down into our reality. We know exactly that and we have the tools to capture it. You know, it's like, imagine like there's like a new rain 
that 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 happens on the new on the on the first of every month, right? On the Hebrew calendar. Just say there was a rain, right? And each rain that came down, you had to go out and get like a bucket or or or, or pans or cups or whatever you have to capture as much of that rain because that particular rain, as you drink it, it provides a certain healing antidote for your body and your mind and your your soul it brings a healing it's like a, this, this it's like this like a this elixir right that you that comes from the heavens and you drink it and then it, it rejuvenates you right and every and, and to be complete you need to receive that from each 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 month each you know each month represents a different aspect of this revealment that you need to intake to complete the completion of the complete healing of yourself for that year, right? So there's no water, but that's what's happening. Every month, there's a light that we need to connect to and rise above, right? And, 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 and that's the difference. That's one of the difference. The, non, the, the other nations don't necessarily have these tools to rise above these influences. They're very much subjugated to them. But we're above that. But we only are above that when we're with the Torah, right? And we have the ability to direct the light. We have the ability to take the attributes of positivity and use them for our bidding. So every month there's a unique light that we need in order to complete the correction of our soul, body, and mind. So with that being said, you know, Kodesh Tov, um, we'll talk more about this specific month, um, Ashfat. And um, the holiness, you know, of this idea of being able to like go against gravity, right? To go against gravity. And we understand this whole thing of going against gravity by being a vessel of sharing. How do we learn that from the trees, right? We learn that. We learn everyone's whole by by gravity. And, you know, I'll say this one story and, and I'll leave, but I really want to save this for the next conversation. But it was uh, a, guy, a guy asked me once, you know, he said, you know, like, what type, he says, when you're, when you're, he says that, you know, LA, you know, this is when I was in LA, LA is a lot of traffic, right? There's a lot of traffic in LA, you know, traffic everywhere. And so the thing is, is that there's a lot of traffic in LA, but people invest in their cars. You know what I'm saying? Like they get really nice cars. Like everyone's like, cars are like such a big thing in LA. You know, it's just like, it's a thing. I, I grew up loving cars. Like I, I could give a whole thing just on cars. But the point is just saying that, and he says, you know, people get like different comfortable cars and this and radio and sound systems and customize this and all this type of stuff, right? He said, but no matter how nice your car is, when traffic is going on, traffic is going on, right? Traffic is happening. Whenever traffic is happening, traffic is happening. No matter how nice your car is, you're sitting in traffic. You may enjoy it a little bit more and say you're, you know, Bentley or something versus, you know, a Honda Civic. You know, I don't even know if they still make those. But the point is just saying something like this, right? But it goes like this. There's a certain car that never has a weight in traffic, no matter what. That car is an ambulance when it's working. Right when an ambulance is going and doing a job, it does. It never has way. Everyone has a pull over, no matter how nice, how expensive, and how big their car is. They have to pull over and make room for the ambulance. You know why? Because the ambulance is going and in, in, in saving is going to save a life. So because that ambulance is going to save a life, everybody, I don't care how expensive your car is, how cool it is, how long you've been waiting in traffic, what's going on, how quickly you got to get to your meeting, it doesn't matter. I have precedent over everything that's going on because my MISA, my work, my job, my avoda is going, is, is, is going to, to save someone else. And so what do we learn by that? We learn that when a person has a mindset and they live a life that's doing for others, building for others, giving to others, when they're doing that, 
the whole universe, the stars, the galaxies, everything, everything moves aside to allow you to do what you need to do. And in fact, not only do they move aside, they, they clear the traffic out for you. They go miles ahead of you and say, get out of the way. There's a great person coming. He's coming to save the life. He's going to do good. Get out of the way. So even the negativity that maybe you had against you in the future said, hey, you know, I got to back off. Not they're, they're, they're saving lives. So may we all understand that, you know, our ultimate destiny is to help others. Our ultimate destiny is to use our unique gifts and talents to be able to empower other people to, to do good for others, you know, but it, it, it only becomes expressed um, when we're connected to the Torah and, and the Torah guides us to do for others. That's what we have mitzvot, that's what we have all these things because it's all about the collective, it's all about giving, it's all about going outside of ourselves. And as we give and as we go, we should draw down the light of this month, that the good qualities of this month and, and forsake the bad sides and, and rise above and connect completely. And we should all, anyone who has any healing should have a speedy recovery. Anybody who you know, is struggling in any way should, should only know success and redemption. Baruch Atah Adonai, Le'olam, Amen, De'amen.